a while ago I saw an amazing video on fluid simulation. And ever since the YouTube algorithm has been recommending me similar videos. One thing that's common in all these is that they discuss particle based simulation. However, there is another way about these problems and that is by solving partial differential equations. PDEs are used to model a wide range of phenomena like fluid flow, heat transfer and wave propagation. PDE based simulators are often used when a system can be described by continuous fields like velocity and pressure for the fluid flow and temperature for the heat transfer. The equation involving wave propagation is quite interesting. In its simplest form, it can be used to simulate the motion of a wave on a string and in the higher dimension, it can simulate a compressional wave generated by an earthquake or even a tsunami wave propagating in deep ocean. Let's see in detail how to simulate these waves accurately. To understand this, I started with the simplest form, which is a 1D wave equation. U is the variable of interest and it defines the displacement of string in the vertical direction as the wave propagates. The second derivative with respect to space and time are linked together in this equation with a couple of other terms like the constant c, which defines the speed of wave propagation. In this case, it is dependent on the material properties like density. The higher the value of c, the faster will the wave propagate. Finally, s is the source function and it is responsible for initiating the wave at location x and time t. The definition of the source function also dictates the shape of the resulting wave. Here is an example of two different source functions. One thing to remember is that the PD is typically defined for the interior of the domain and not the boundaries. What this means is that I have to explicitly define the solution at these boundaries given an initial state of the system. What I can do is clamp the two ends fixed or make both ends free or even add some kind of cushion to absorb the energy. But let's not get too much ahead of ourselves and look into how to actually solve this thing. I want to solve this in the xt domain. Right now this is continuous with infinitely many points and solving PD analytically in this domain would be quite challenging. This is where I can use numerical methods and discretize the domain into finite points. To keep things simple, let's limit the domain to 10 meters and 1 seconds with a total of 121 points. What I hope to achieve with this is that now I only need to get the value of u at these finite number of points and anything in between can be approximated via simple interpolation. Remember when I said that the PDE is only defined for the interior points and I have to predefine the boundaries and the initial condition. Let's fix these values to zero. We have so far discretized the domain into finite points, but the PDE is still in a continuous form. Starting with the source function, what I need here is the source that should be instantaneous in both space and time. I mean, if you look at a tsunami generated by an earthquake, the source releases a lot of energy in a really small amount of time and is quite localized. To simulate this effect, I'm going to turn to the derivative of a Gaussian function. If I plot this function against time, I can make it as instantaneous as I want by varying the frequency term. By the way, T0 decides when the source will go off, so I can adjust that as well. Anyways, this takes care of the time domain and I want something similar in the spatial domain as well, where the energy released has to be localized. To do this, I want to draw your attention to the domain discretization and call the distance between two points in x direction as dx. Ideally, I would like a delta function but this behavior can be approximated using a box car function like this. Now as the dx decreases, the source will become more and more localized. This is exactly what I want. Finally, I can get the complete definition of source function by multiplying the two together. Now with the functional form of the source, we can just evaluate it at a specific grid point. For example, if I want to place a source at say x is equal to 9 meters, I would just evaluate the source function at this location. The derivative terms are approximated with the help of Taylor series. Let me give you a quick refresher on Taylor series. Consider an arbitrary function and we know its value at some point x. What Taylor series does is gives a way to approximate the value of this function at another point x plus dx using f evaluated at x, the first derivative of f evaluated at x, the second derivative of f evaluated at x and so on. How accurate f of x plus dx is depends on two things. Firstly, the dx itself. 
for now, let's forget all the higher order derivatives in the Taylor series and just keep the first derivative. Now, you can see that the smaller the value of dx, the more accurate the approximation is. See how the true and approximated value gets closer and closer as the dx becomes smaller and smaller. Another way is to keep adding higher order derivatives and the more we add, the better accuracy we get. Keep these two points in mind as they will come in handy when we actually write a wave simulator. Similarly, I can write another equation to approximate the value of f at x minus dx. Adding these two equations, the odd derivatives cancel out. Now if I rearrange the term, second order derivative gets isolated on the right hand side with fourth and higher order derivative terms. I can ignore these terms as long as I keep in mind that these terms are of the order of dx squared. So this gives a way to approximate second derivative with respect to x and t, which I can plug back into the PDE itself. Looking back at this discrete version of the PDE, there is only one term that represents the future value of u. Let's keep this on the left hand side and move everything else over to the right. It's important to connect this equation to the numerical grid. I'm going to start at a point where x is equal to 1 and t is equal to 0 0.2. This corresponds to u of x t plus dt term in the equation. Similarly, the next term is the point at x is equal to 1 and t is equal to 0 0.1. To be honest, I don't know this value, but for simplicity, I can assume that it is the same as one time step before, which incidentally is the next term in the equation. I know the medium velocity and the grid spacing. Next we move on to the approximation of the second order derivative and look at where each point is located in the grid. Notice that I know all these values on the right hand side and after plugging them in I get the unknown on the left. The same process is repeated for the next point and the next and so on. It is important to note that at each step I am only using the values calculated in the previous step. So the order is important here. Coding this is actually quite simple. Firstly, I will initialize at time step dt minus 1 and dt. For simplicity, I'm going to assume a zero initial state. Then I create a placeholder value for the solution at a future time step. Now comes the interesting part. This is where I loop over different points on the grid. You can see how different parts are coded. And I start with the space derivative term here. If you remember, source is placed at a specific location and here I'm using an if statement and checking if I should include a source response or not. This loop moves over the grid points and solve the wave equation at each location. Finally, the boundary conditions are explicitly defined and the loop continues on to the next time step. Upon completion, we have the complete solution of the wave equation. I also wrote a simple interactive notebook where I can simulate the 1D wave equation using different settings. Keeping the length of string fixed at 100 meters, I set the number of points in x dimensions to 101. This dictates the step size and spatial dimension. I ran the simulation for 2 seconds and the step size in temporal domain was 0.001. Using derivative of a Gaussian with dominant frequency of 5 Hz as the source function, I positioned it right in the middle. If I plot the solution at different time steps, you can see that the wave started to disintegrate. Something was off here. The final result was not quite accurate. In the finite difference approximation, to get more accurate results, I should keep dx really small. This is because it contributes significantly to the errors in the simulation. Even looking at this, you can see if I keep dx small, the terms after second derivative will vanish as they will have dx raised to the power of 4, 6, 8 and so on multiplied to the higher order derivatives. Let's decrease the step size to 0.09. Now the solution was quite accurate. While discussing source term, I made a big deal about source being impulsive. Let's do that by increasing the dominant frequency to 20. Now the resulting impulse was localized but it again started disintegrating. Another way to fix this is by using a more accurate approximation. If you look at the finite difference formula, it's using three points to approximate the derivative. There is no restriction on us to not use more points. A very common option is to use five points instead of three. I'm not going to derive the formula, but we'll leave a link in the description for anyone who's interested. 
So the derivative approximation using five points is something like this. And from this formula, you can see that the term after second derivative is of the order of dx to the power four. So even a slightly larger value of dx should send these terms approximately to zero. Updating the code to use five point stencil instead of three was not that complicated. There were just a few differences. Firstly, the loop in the spatial dimension now skips the two points on each end. And then obviously the definition of the spatial derivative itself was different. Finally, the boundary consisted of two points on each side instead of one. So now when I selected five point stencil instead of three, you can see that the accuracy increased, but there were still small issues in the waveform. I reduced the step size even further to 0.05 and that did no good. The solution just blew up. As I move forward in time, the amplitudes were out of control. This was not expected. After researching a little bit, I found out that this is a stability issue, which is different from accuracy. And to understand this, we need to look into von Neumann analysis. Again, I'm not going to cover the complete analysis. And to be fair, there are already some excellent resources available online. So the result from the phenomenon analysis is known as a CFL condition, and it relates the grid spacing dx and dt with the medium velocity. Epsilon depends on the dimensionality and the numerical scheme. In this case, it is equal to one. Conceptually, this relation is quite interesting. On the right hand side, we have something that's known as a grid velocity. What this essentially tells is the minimum velocity that our grid can facilitate. And CFL condition basically tells that we should ensure that this is always greater than or equal to the actual medium velocity. If you think about it for a second, this actually makes sense. All right. So after incorporating the CFL calculation in the notebook, I can check at a glance whether the solution would be stable or not. And you can see here that it was greater than one. Looking at the formula, I can resolve this issue by decreasing the step size in the temporal domain. Now the solution is stable again and the accuracy is even better. So far, I've kept the boundaries fixed. This was very easy to implement. All I had to do was just enforce zero at the boundary points. With this, you can see as the wave reaches boundary, it flips while keeping the ends intact. Another thing I can do is make the boundaries free. Mathematically, this is enforced by making the first derivative at the boundary zero. Using finite difference approximation, I can rewrite this and implement the free boundary condition in the code quite easily. The one that I was actually looking forward to is known as the absorbing boundary condition. As the name suggests, the waves will get absorbed as they collide with the boundaries. I was trying to learn more about this and that's when I found an amazing paper that basically had everything I needed. To be honest, there were a lot of things that I did not understand in this paper, but I got the basic idea that these boundary conditions are implemented by actually solving a PDE at the boundaries itself. The paper also laid out a set of equations that solve this PDE. I wanted to keep things simple, so I went ahead with the first order absorbing boundary condition and wrote the equations in code. If you want to know more about how these were derived, please check out the description where I've provided a link to this paper. So finally, I implemented three different boundary conditions and they work as expected. As I started working on the 2D wave equation, I was pleasantly surprised to see that it is not that different from the 1D case. Looking at the differential equations in the 2D version, we just have another spatial dimension. That's it. Everything else is exactly the same. Uh, well, except in the 2D case, I'm also considering a heterogeneous domain where the velocity can be uniform or not. As far as the boundaries are concerned, Instead of a couple of points at the end of a string, we now have four different edges. The changes in the code are quite obvious. For our 1D case, the fields are stored as a 1D array, but for the 2D, they have both X and Z dimensions. 1D only has two loops, one over time and one over the X dimension. For 2D, we have three loops, one for the time and two for the spatial domain. We just need to evaluate the derivative with respect to X for a 1D wave equation. But in case of 2D, we need an additional derivative with respect to Z. Update to the solution is almost similar, except the fact that I'm considering heterogeneous domain in the 2D case. For the boundaries in 2D, we just enforce the same conditions over all the points along each boundary. All right, let's run a few cases and visualize 2D waves. Starting with the basic setting like one meter spacing in X and Z dimensions, 0.01 second step size in time, source with a dominant frequency of 5, and a homogeneous medium with 100 meters per second velocity. 
the simulation looks fine, with waves reflecting off the boundaries as expected. By the way, whatever I discussed in 1D wave simulation is still valid here. For instance, when I increase the source frequency to 20, you can see the disintegration in the wave. I can resolve this issue by decreasing the step size in the spatial domain. Mind you, there are still some inaccuracies, which I can largely fix by using a 5-point stencil. Heterogeneity in the medium will make things quite interesting. See how the reflections are generated when the waves reach the interface. It will be clearer if I switch to absorbing boundary conditions. It's as if the velocity interface acts as a boundary in itself. Let's increase this velocity to 500. Looking at the CFL criteria, I need to decrease the time step as well. Notice how higher the velocity, the more obstruction it causes to the wave. Looking at this angle, it's not like the wave is not passing at all, but it's getting dissipated quickly, which is expected in a medium with higher velocity. If I put this velocity interface right on the source, now we can see that the waves are moving and dissipating quickly on one side compared to the other. I could go on and on with this, and you can too with the code in the description. In this video, I started with the basic 1D wave simulation and then extended the analysis to the 2D case. Sometime in the future, I would like to extend this to 3D and add GPU support. Another thing I could try is use pseudo-spectral or finite element method instead of finite differences to actually solve the PDE. If you've made it this far in the video, please do let me know down in the comments as to what you would like to see. That's all for today and I'll see you next time.